So yeah, so this call is now being recorded. <laughs> and um, well, as I said, I'll let the co-leads of the Equity Action Group introduce today's speakers in just a moment. Currently, all of your lines are on mute, and I hear some folks are still joining the call, so I apologize about the beeps. Um, but I will be taking your call. I will be taking the lines off of me. So um, just a little bit about phone etiquette in this situation. Um, I will not be muting all of the lines automatically once we get started. I ask that callers mute their own lines to keep background noise to a minimum. If you are a speaker on today's call, please be sure to unmute yourself when you're presenting and later when you're answering questions. It's also a very important note to share for all callers. Please do not put your phones on hold while you are on the call. Doing so will cause, cause all of us to hear hold music and or any messages your organization broadcasts. Um, next, I want to direct you to the documents and slides for today's call. Uh, this is an audio only call, so the documents aren't absolutely necessary to follow along. But if you would like to access the documents, you can either click on the links in the reminder email that you received from CityMatch, or you can visit citymatch.org, that's C-I-T-Y-M-A-T-C-H dot org, and you're going to go to the right side of that page under the heading Newsroom. You'll click on the top link that says City Match Equity Action Group Call, Reducing Health Disparities, March 30th. There you'll find links to documents provided by each of today's speakers. So let's move on to our health disparities discussion. Um, I will ask that each of our two speakers, Kimberly Hooks and Shannon Jones, to speak for about 15 minutes each and then we'll open up the floor for five to 10 minutes of questions and answers after each of their presentations. So I'm now gonna unmute all of the lines. Again, I ask that you mute your phones individually, and then I will turn it over to Dr. Zenobia Harris. So Dr. Harris, make sure that you unmute your line and we'll go ahead and get started. The conference has been unmuted. Thank you, Becky. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm driving in the rain, so if there's a lot of background information, background noise, I apologize. We can hear you. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much for participating in our call today. And I'm very, very um, excited to introduce our guest speaker. Kimberly, are you on the line? Kimberly Hooks, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Great. Great. Kimberly Hooks is our Community Health Nurse Specialist Supervisor with the Arkansas Department of Health, and she has worked many years in public health and now is uh, leading the work of a lot of our community health specialists out in communities working with our local schools. And today is going to be talking about how they work, their work reduces disparities through their improvement efforts. Kimberly? Okay. I had sent four documents and don't know that you had a chance to look at them. And uh, so 15 minutes I'm going to try to summarize um, the importance of each document that I sent. The first document was uh, taken from our 100 years of service with the Department of Health here in Arkansas. And it explained what our community health nurses and our community health promotion specialists <coughs> actually do. Um, and how it all started. And it started back in 2001 when uh, the Coalition for a Healthier Arkansas Today chart formed to assess the state's needs and formulate a plan to spend the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement or the MSA funds. And Arkansas chose to spend their money on health, which was a very good decision. And one of the things that came out of that the, the School Nurse Association lobbied and wanted more school nurses. And that would have taken up probably all of that money to do that. And so someone came up with the great idea of hiring community health nurse specialists to serve in the educational co-ops and to work with the school nurses. And so that's how it all started. So in 2002, I was one of the original ones that was hired and stationed in a co-op uh, that serviced three counties. And there were, um, there's a map that I sent to you that shows where our nurses are housed and where our promotion specialists are housed. Um, 
the nurses were hired in 2002, and our focus was mainly the school nurses. We provided um, annual trainings on hearing, vision, scoliosis, and BMI, and we did a whole, whole lot of tobacco prevention and cessation efforts all across the state for many, many years, and we continue to do that since this is the tobacco settlement funds. That's part of our everyday job. Um, we are housed within the hometown health improvement section, which is under our Center for Local Public Health. My direct supervisor um, is Andy Ridgway, and under me I have 11 people, eight of which are nurses, and three of which are our promotion specialists. And I supervise the south part of the state, and my counterpart, Marilyn Cone, has the remaining 11 staff in the north part of the state. Uh, the community promotion specialist came on about a year later under Act 1220 of 2003. And their main work is work with the wellness committees. Um, they implement, try to implement regular physical activity and nutrition standards and policies approved by the State Board of Health and the State Board of Education. Um, our chips and chins, I think, are the direct link between Department of Health and Department of Education. There seems to be kind of you know, a disconnect, but ever since this job came aboard, we have been able to do so much more with our schools, and being housed in the educational co-ops was, I think, a very uh, critical aspect of this, because you began your relationship with your schools and um, was able to reach them through something that they were already coming to. The next document um, I was presented at the Southern Health, uh, the Southern Obesity Summit in 2013, and put together a um, document called the Arkansas Department of Health Community Health Nurse Specialist: A Decade of Promoting and Improving Health in Arkansas Schools and Communities. And I talked about the background and then the role, and then I have listed a lot of our activities that we do. Um, mainly identifying and evaluating training needs of school nurses. School nurses have to, to uh, provide scoliosis, BMI, hearing and vision trainings, and so our community health nurses do these trainings for our school nurses annually, and most times we end up doing them two to three times a year because of such turnover with new school nurses. Um, we participate in policy development school-based enforcement of tobacco-related policies, um, act as a liaison between schools, community coalitions, hometown health improvement, and our health care providers. We plan and implement activities and programs based on needs and founded on best health, public health practices, provide a lot of mentorship, orientation, training, and update for school nurses. And I say school nurses, but we also work with our teachers, our counselors, um, our health education, so we work with a lot of people at the schools. We have a Arkansas State School Nurse Consultant who works directly um, with the schools and with the community health nurse specialist. So if we have, if our community health nurse specialist has a question, she'll come to her supervisor first, and then we'll go to our state school nurse consultant, and if she doesn't know the answer, we usually call the State Board of Nursing and get our answers that way. Um, we do a lot of presentations, a lot of health and disease updates for school staff, students, and as well as families. We serve on school wellness committees that address policy on school health screenings and health issues. We also participate in health policy development and disseminate model policies such as tobacco and nutrition policies. We've been able to um, implement a comprehensive tobacco policy in a lot of our schools with, across the state. Um, we facilitate workshops for teachers, counselors, mental health. We have done a lot of suicide prevention trainings. Arkansas mandated that they, uh, teachers and educators have at least two hours of that this year, and so they have really been doing a lot of suicide prevention training. We also do uh, teen pregnancy, SCI prevention. We work with civic groups and organizations. We are, we were, I think, I'm going to go to that fourth document, which is our top ten pager. 
and these were considered top 10 public health achievements of the first decade of the 21st century. The first one talks about the chart and how it all started. Um, but out of these, our community health nurses and promotion specialists were um, involved with it, at least five of them. And I think a critical component to our 2009 influenza immunization program was our community health nurses. I don't think it would have been a, such a, a good a success had we not had the community health nurses already in place. They were able to go in and organize and um, help and set up these clinics in the schools when we were providing the H1N1 influenza virus. And that has been a success ever since. We still continue to do that. The um, community health promotion specialist really work a lot with Act 1220 of 2003. And they have been able to work with wellness committees, um, continue to do so. We have some schools that are really active and some schools that are not quite so active. And the Department of Ed has recently gone to a um, stricter monitoring system for um, wellness activities. So we think we'll be seeing a lot more improvements, hopefully, within the next year or two um, with our wellness committees in the schools. I'm not sure how long I've been talking. Do I still have a few minutes, or? You have a couple more minutes. Yep, you still have a couple minutes, no problem. OK, I just wanted to make sure. Um, we have helped with the reduction of adult and youth tobacco use. We focus primarily um, on K through 12, but we also work with preschool and colleges when we have the chance. Um, work a lot with hometown health improvement. They focus more on our communities, and so we partner with them and do pretty much anything that we need to in our communities as well as our schools. I think that's pretty much the basics. I just kind of wanted to explain the map a little bit if you get a chance to look at it. Um, what it is is the, the names of the co-ops are listed, like Northwest, Ozark, North Central, Northeast, et cetera. Um, Pulaski County does not have a co-op, but we do have a community health nurse and a community health promotion specialist stationed at Pulaski County in one of our local health units. So we service the, uh, and that's some of our really big school districts are in Pulaski County. So on the map it will tell you each of these co-ops have a nurse. And there are only um, six promotion specialists. And those look really heavy. When I put this map together, I thought, hmm, that looks really heavy in the top part of our state. But we have a lot, a lot of schools in our northwest region. So that's why we have a couple of our uh, community health promotion specialists stationed so close together. And I think that's pretty much it. I want to be able to save time for questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this is Becky again with City Match. Um, that was a, a great presentation, and I'm sure that with all of the callers on the line, we have plenty of questions. So if you have a question, um, please go ahead and unmute yourself, and we'll try to just do it in an orderly fashion. I don't think everyone will, will come screaming in at once. So um, go ahead and have, ask any questions you have regarding this. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Lisette. I was just uh, listening to your presentation. So you, my question is, all the nurses are going to be trainee, trained to give mentorship to at the school? Hello? Yes. Um, our, our school nurses are really out there, and they don't really have someone to come to. Not every school has a very strong uh, school nurse supervisor. A lot of our schools have one nurse. They may be brand new, and they don't have anywhere to turn. So they will contact our community health nurse specialist, and um, we pretty much get the ball rolling. Uh, we train them. We orient them. We um, mentor them. We do not supervise them. So that's the one thing that we do not do. We do not supervise the school nurses, but we pretty much provide the mentorship 
um, orientation, training, and we also link them up with other school nurses that have been in the school nurse business for a long time and would be good mentors in um, this them in that way too. Thank you. The conference has been unmuted. Hello, can you guys hear me? Good. Any other questions? And be sure Hello? to unmute yourself if you have a question. I can hear you, whoever spoke. Go ahead and ask your question. So my question was in regards to the uh, teen pregnancy and STI prevention uh, workshops. Are those workshops just between the school nurses, counselors, and teachers, or do the uh, nurses in Arkansas Department of Health go into classrooms and teach those courses to schools themselves, like the students? We do both of those. If a school wants a presentation, we've got them ready and we will go to them. Uh, we also provide, uh, a lot of our trainings are provided at our co-op, so therefore we reach a lot more people when they're able to, um, if they're able to get out of school to come to our trainings at the co-ops. But we will and we do a lot of going out into the schools and doing the presentations for the staff and for students. And uh, what kind of curriculum do you guys use? Is it one that you developed yourself or is it a, an evidence-based curriculum that's already been developed? There, we have uh, PowerPoints that have been developed, and it's really touch and go with some schools because some schools will let you talk about anything, and other schools are like you can only talk about abstinence. Okay. So we have to tailor to what the school says that we can talk about. We don't have a per se curriculum. We have worked with the Department of Education and Kathleen Courtney on various grants and uh, they have provided curriculum and we've done that in the past. Okay. I have a question about how much your community health ner nurses work on nutrition. Do they do much with nutrition service directors? Do they do much with school meals, with nutrition education? That would fall more under our community health promotion specialist. That would be something that they do. Now the school nurses, I mean the health nurses will serve on wellness committees, but the direct relationship nutrition and food service would come more under our community health promotion specialist. Thank you. Are the community health promotion specialists nurses, or what is their background? No, they're not nurses. Um, they have various backgrounds. Most of them are either an education type role, like we have a uh, master certified public health educator. Um, we have a dietetic. So they're just different um, degrees that they have. We prefer a degree in nutrition. That would be excellent. Or public health education. Those are probably the top two that we look for. Could you explain a little bit more about when you say you educational co-ops? What, what, how are those set up? I tried to get a brochure um, that they're really unique, and I was with the co-op director, and she could tell the whole story. They were set up years ago, probably 25 years ago, and they were set up to service the schools. So schools pay to be a member of this educational co-op. And the board is made up of superintendents from the schools that those, uh, those co-ops service. They provide a variety of services. And there are 15 co-ops, and not all of them um, have the same. A lot of them have early childhood programs. Um, they have hippie programs where they go out into the home. There are math specialists. Um, science specialists. They're really a wonderful thing, and um, I probably don't do justice talking about an educational co-op because there's so much that they do, and when I was housed there, my eyes were opened as to what kind of services.
are interested in finding out more information about the educational co-ops, I would recommend that you go to the Arkansas Department of Education. And then if you click on the E, it will take you to educational co-ops. And you might find out a little bit more history because they are really very unique. And I'm glad we have them. Great, thanks. Any other questions for Kimberly? Okay, great. We will go ahead and um, thank you so much, Kimberly. And um, again, the documents are available to you on the City Mesh website. Um, and we will go ahead and if I could get um, Sherry Williams, our second Equity Action Group co-lead, to say hello and introduce our next speaker. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, as Nobia said, we thank you all for joining us on this call today. And, and I'm very excited to um, have with us Mr. Shannon Jones. I've known Shannon for a long time. He is currently the director of the Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department in Austin, Texas. Um, but he's been in public health for a long time. So I'm just excited to have him share with you some of the work that they're doing, some of the wonderful work they're doing in Austin. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Shannon. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sherry. Hopefully everyone can hear us here. Um, I am joined by our staff who will be available to answer any questions after our presentation. We have our planning manager, uh, Cassie De Leon. We have our CHA chip uh, planner, Ms. Haley Hale, and our manager for health equity, Ms. Adrian Serra. As we follow along on the slides, I'll just go through them rather quickly. Um, Austin Travis County, our vision is that we will have the healthier community in the nation. Our mission is, of course, is to prevent disease, promote health, and protect the well-being of our community. The core purpose of our department is to promote community-wide wellness, preparedness, and self-sufficiency. We are a health and human services department, so we both do the public health as well as human services part. In our public health, we also focus in on prevent illness, injury, and disease, and protect the community from infectious diseases, environmental hazards, and epidemics. When we look at Austin, uh, Travis County overall, uh, we're one of the healthiest uh, communities in the nation and in Texas. In the recent rankings of uh, 241 counties in Texas, uh, Travis County ranked number nine in terms of uh, healthiest, meaning we're the ninth healthiest in the state. Uh, we were by far the healthiest of all urban communities, so Austin overall ranked higher than uh, Houston Harris County, Dallas County, San Antonio Bear County, Fort Worth, and Tarrant County. So we're one of the healthiest urban counties. We have a uh, diverse mix of races, cultures, and ethnicities in our communities, and we are one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. Uh, despite that, we have significant disparity. What we see particularly in our county is that the disparities have moved as populations have moved. Historically, most of African Americans, um, Hispanics, and others in our county lived in the e e early in the core of the community. And like many of the issues of social determinants, we saw that there were negative health outcomes in those communities. Over the last 15 years, what we've seen as a result of affordability in our community is that those communities have moved out to the fringes of the community. Uh, and so what we've seen is the demographics of those zip codes change as well as the population. And so in the eastern part of the county, we see significant issues of poverty, which we historically have not. Lack of education, more uninsured, and greater concentration of populations of color in those areas. When we look at the data trends for uh, our Travis County, particularly populations of color, as they are nationwide, are experiencing disproportionality upon, uh, in terms of higher rates. So HIV, AIDS, teen pregnancy, infant mortality, 
chronic disease such as cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, tobacco use, obesity, poverty, particularly among children and youth in our community, gonorrhea rates are high, and limited access to transportation, healthy foods, and primary and mental health care. These are factors that we're seeing that are impacting particularly populations of color. If you look at our charts, and we won't go through, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but these charts clearly indicate the disparities. When we look at HIV people living with HIV and AIDS in our TPA, which is roughly our metropolitan area, we see that blacks are almost three to four times higher rates of HIV AIDS, living with HIV and AIDS than whites, Hispanic, and other populations. When we look at our teen births in Travis County, we All see right. that Hispanics have significant higher rates of teen births in our community. When we look at infant mortality rates, once again, not unique to Austin, Travis County, but we see here also one of the healthiest counties in the nation. We still see significant disparities among African Americans and the population that we see in our community. Our next chart indicates uh, the issues of causes of death in our community. And when we look at the eight leading, when we look at the leading causes of death in our community, we see that African Americans uh, rank eighth in number of the leading causes of death in these major areas: Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, accidents, chronic lung disease, and stroke. Uh, so we see once again the disparities. Uh, some of the good news, though, is that over the last several years, uh, African Americans ranked 10 in those, so over these last few years, those numbers have come down slightly. Our next slide, we talk a little bit about tobacco use and prevalence in our community. We see particularly uh, diabetes rates, uh, we see uh, chronic disease rates, African Americans and Hispanics significantly <laughs> higher, smoking and obesity. Once again, remind you, this is one of the well, health, healthiest counties in the state. So despite being healthy, we still have significant disparities in our community. Looking at poverty rates, overall the population uh, is doing better than other parts, but once again, we see particularly a younger populations, older populations, Hispanic populations, and African American populations are disproportionately burdened with issues of poverty in our community. A gonorrhea incidence rates for our community, once again, unfortunately, the African-American population is significantly burdened by the disparity of those things. Well, having stated that, we have recognized this for quite some time, and we have been advocating with our legislative, our community, and others to address that. And so we've listed for you some of the efforts that we've undertaken over the last uh, 13 years to begin to address those. We've had several conferences, town hall meetings, and the like, to bring awareness to this issue, not only to our community, but to our legislator, both the uh, commissioner's court, which governs the county of Travis, and our city council, which governs the city of Austin. And so we see health disparities conference in 2001 and in 2003. Uh, we looked at the greater central Texas area in 2005, recognizing that the problem we saw here in Austin and Travis County are not just unique to our county, but to the community in which we think of the laws. As we look at that particularly, we had the opportunity back in 2005 to present to city council some recommendations based upon what we call the African American quality of life to address some specific strategies to address issues in the African American community. And I won't read all of them, but I'll just highlight a couple of them. One of them we've identified is that there was need for a primary care facility that worked that focused primarily on African Americans. Because the population of African Americans are relatively small, roughly 8% presently in Travis County, there was no one place that African Americans felt that they could go get a culturally sensitive and culturally reflective uh, service delivery. So we recommended services in that area. We talked about trying to recruit more African American providers. Uh, we recognized that there were, at that time, only one or two uh, psychiatrists in this area and only about uh, seven or eight uh, African-American primary physicians back in those days. So we worked to try and elevate the numbers who are in this community by recruiting and activities. We developed several uh, uh, community and media c 
campaigns to talk about the issues in our community and to raise the awareness. And we put uh, some mental health counselors, particularly on some of our outreach vans that we had in those activities. Uh, so those are the things we began to do back in uh, uh, 2005. Based upon that, we, there were some other things that we continued to work on. There were several discussion groups around issues of prostate cancer in, the, in our population, working with our local hospital system, uh, seats and health, uh, family of health. We also had uh, several screenings around mammograms, uh, focusing on apartment complexes where African Americans particularly lived in. And that we uh, launched in 2011 our first community health assessment, which is our effort as a department to look across the boundaries of our community, look at what the community looked like, and more importantly, to hear from the community what specifically we needed to do to address the disparities that we had outlined in our data. One of the things that we did also uniquely is that we divided the county up into quadrants and the city up into quadrants. So we didn't do just the holistic approach of the county. We looked into its subunits and its subsections, and we went in and interviewed uh, individuals in town hall meetings and focus groups and key indicators to find out specifically what are some of the recommendations that we need to carry forth to that, to our community. And as a result of that, there were, uh, we began what we call our Community Health Improvement Plan, which is actually the CHIP, which we put forth based upon the findings from our uh, assessment four priority areas that the community identified. Those were chronic disease with a focus on obesity. The second priority, and they're not in any order, they're all equal in importance, but the second one was the built environment with a focus on food access. What we clearly saw is that there are significant swaths of our county where there were no food, fast food, pardon me, no um, health, healthy food access points for populations of color or for anyone. People had to drive seven to eight miles to get access to these points. The third point was that transportation. What we saw as a result of gentrification that we saw in our inner city is that these populations that moved out or been forced out to these areas had no way to get back in to their doctors, to their nurses, or to their other health care providers, or even to work in many cases. And so they ended up unemployed with no access to health care, ended up utilizing the emergency rooms, which resulted in, of course, increased costs in our community for providing of care. And so transportation was a major issue in the recommendation we put forth to begin to address in terms of this. And then, of course, the last but not certainly not least priority that was identified was that of access to health care. Once again, as population moved further out to the fringes of our community, uh, there were no facilities. Uh, these are areas that were unincorporated in communities that did not have infrastructure. So we needed to talk about how do we bring uh, facilities, both public health and health care services, to those communities where the new population now resided. So those are the things we did over the last 10, 10 to 15 years. In 2015, as a result of all the efforts that had been going on for quite some time, uh, and through the work of particularly uh, advocates in our community, uh, City Council was approached with their effort to begin to address these by putting some additional and some substantial dollars into those. So on May the 7th, 2015, City Council passed a two-part resolution that directed the city manager to establish a working group to gather information for improving health outcomes in infants, mothers, and other communities. Uh, and that working group was made up of a variety of uh, areas. Uh, and I won't go through all of them, but focusing on the LGTB community, the African American community, the immigrants' rights community, the um, mothers and uh, prenatal care community, and particularly to have as part of these working groups the staff of Health and Human Services. And so there was a series of working groups that came together over six meetings uh, beginning in May and running through August in which issues, ideas, suggestions, recommendations were put forth to begin to address those issues that the data pointed to. There was, we would develop some short-term goals and some long-term goals, uh, develop a community engagement process where the community would be on an ongoing basis be involved in those activities. 
We held uh, two community engagement meetings, of which over 100 residents convened to provide input for recommendations. As a result of that, uh, there was some significant in, uh, recommendations made that had significant impact in terms of our, our ability to address these issues. Recommendations to Council, uh, $1 million in additional funding to Health and Human Services to begin to address these services. These services would be community-based that are culturally specific, non-traditional, innovative, focused on individual groups that are disproportionately impacted. Those communities that I mentioned, the LGBT community, the immigrant rights communities, communities of color, and particularly uh, mothers and youth. Particularly addressing issues of chronic disease for African American communities. Things such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, sickle cell, and HIV AIDS. Mental health access, particularly for the immigrants communities. Maternal and infant health care for communities of color. And sexual health and wellness for the LGBT community. Those resulted in particularly funding of a million dollars to be able to address those issues. So as part of our budget for this year, we were an additional million dollars were provided to begin those efforts. Uh, we, will provide, we will provide those services through contractors with working with our um, nonprofit community, which often have quite a significant nonprofit uh, community here. The second area of which significant impact uh, in terms of our budget was 1.8 million was allocated for social services so that will focus on homelessness in our community. Austin has a significant homelessness pro uh, problem in our community, and so those dollars will address that. Basic need services, such as food, shelter, and clothing. Behavioral health, that's a significant problem in our community, uh, both impacting the physical health, but also the mental health and substance abuse communities we see. Workforce development, increasing the ability of people to find jobs in our community, and focusing on youth and children. Those dollars that were allocated were roughly in the following areas. Maternal and child health, there was $390,000 earmarked for that. For African-American health disparities, $410,000. For youth, for elderly services, $50,000. And for LGTB community, $100,000. And immigrant mental health, $100,000. Uh, in addition to that, there were three new staff added to our department which we develop our health equity unit that will focus in on making sure that we achieve the goals that are put forth in the recommendation and that the money is spent targeted and wisely in making differences in outcomes and not just performances. Um, so as we look forward to next steps, we're beginning uh, the process of contracting uh, with the agencies to begin the effort to achieve those outcomes in improving the health in those communities. But we're not stopping there. We've also been directed to, as part of the next year's budget, which would be our FY17 budget, is to come forth with some additional dollars. Uh, overall, the city had made a, uh, was looking at, based upon this resolution, increasing social services by uh, roughly $12 million over the next uh, five years and increasing additional funding for health and human services operations by $10 million over the next two to four years. Uh, and so those are the dollars that we're looking for, how we're going to spend them, what additional things we'll be doing, how do we measure those efforts in terms of addressing these disparities. We must admit we did not do this by ourselves. We worked obviously with our partners in our community. We are a community of partners, so the health department is one of those partners in terms of uh, moving this effort along. Uh, we work with partners in those uh, in terms of identifying data to help us substantiate the arguments we made. And some of those are some things such as uh, our uh, uh, fire department, our emergency services department, and our other emergency uh, departments, APD and others, to help us in identifying particular areas and issues that we have identified. And then uh, as we go into our planning of our uh, CHA chip for our second go-round, we're completing our first CHA chip. Uh, uh, we will be looking at these factors, and uh, as we look at a gen uh, our launch in January 2017, we're going to take into account what we've done, how successful we've been, engaging those same communities and engaging uh, some of the same efforts we've done to re have that reflected in our chart. Uh, finally, uh, our performance analysis and development of, of F 
why our next uh, year performance goals will be focused on outcome measures and not just on performances. So what difference have we made, not how many widgets have we performed? Uh, we're in the process of completing the hiring for our staff. We'll move towards uh, executing the contracts for the money identified. And as we said, we've been again identified the resolution for 2017. So that's sort of sort of a quick analysis of what we've been doing here in Austin, Travis County, to begin to try and address the issues of health inequity in our community. We're proud of our community. We think of the fact that it's the ninth healthiest in the state. We're trying to be number one. Uh, we recognize, though, that we still have a long ways to go and that we must bring all boats aboard and not just certain ones in our community. So well, that's an overview. We stand available to answer any questions you may have about our efforts here in Austin and Travis County. Thank you so much, Shannon. Other questions? Hi, Mr. Jones. This is uh, Chris Engelstad from Florida calling. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful, and uh, I applaud you for all your successes. I don't know if this question should be directed to you or someone in your group. Uh, I have some questions about your um, community engagement meetings. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so in gen just general questions and then some a little more specific. Um, how did you decide who to invite? Where were they held? Uh, did you present data to the community? And how did you solicit um, recommendations from your residents and were those specific re recommendations then carried through and brought to your council? Okay, I'll answer and ask our uh, staff to also join. As I said earlier, we divided the county up into quadrants, uh, the northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and the city likewise. And we identified particular neighborhoods based upon the data that we had going into the CHA chip to identify what specifically the data showed. And so when we went into community, we shared the data. So yes, we did present the data, and we asked them, one, to react to the data first, and then we asked them to share with us other data points that we may not have identified and other things that they felt that contributed to the factors or other things that we did not identify as health out concerns in our community. So yes, they were very actively involved and engaged in those efforts uh, throughout the county and throughout the city. I think another important part of that process was uh, in order to help us define what um, initiatives would be most beneficial, we asked them about their experiences based on healthcare access, transportation. So it kind of gave some depth and breadth to the data when we were presenting to council because we had those that real community response to back up the data. Was that, was that okay? Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. I have a question. This is Tia Henderson in Portland, Oregon. I'm wondering, I haven't looked at your chip in depth, but can you talk a little bit about different partners outside of the Public Health Division who are actively working with you to change some of the social determinant health aspects based on some of the strategies you identified with your community members? Hi, yes, this is Haley. Um, I'm the planner for the Community Health Assessment, Community Health Improvement Plan. And um, with our Community Health Improvement Plan, we're actually in the third year of implementation. And what we've seen is that um, we've actually heard a lot of nonprofits echoing the same uh, information that we see in our own reports, that there's a lot of disparities in food access. Um, uh, availability of the physical environment. So we see um, Parks and Recreation is doing a lot of outreach. Um, also, we have some non nonprofits such as the, like the Hunger Initiative that are also, um, you know, trying to address these and they uh, address these uh, gaps in resources that they that they find. And um, usually, it starts with a lot of raising awareness about where the gaps are and uh, kind of continues the discussion from around how to organize those resources from there. 
And the role of the chip really in working with these outside partners is to just get them connected to some of the resources and uh, leadership that the city might be able to offer just because we've been um, trying to address the issue of um, health equity for, as Shannon went over, uh, over 15 years <laughs> that we're aware of. <laughs> and I just would like to add, add, as the CHA and the chip were being developed, One Voice Central Texas was a key um, organization that we really worked with and there is an umbrella organization that represents multiple social service agencies mm -hmm. that really helps to bring in that voice to um, the child chip from a social determinant perspective and um, has really helped to identify the cancer. But access to health care piece from um, address is not just health care but also behavioral health and integration of that into the health care system to try to improve that output as far as looking at patient centered care and really trying to hone in on where those gaps in service delivery exist and knowing that it's you know, the issues that are facing the indigent population, although it's, there's primary care issues there, but also the gaps in behavioral health that exist are key to improving that overall um, um, health outcome that we're trying to achieve and trying to improve that as a, as a, because that's an access barrier as well. Great, thanks. Great. Any additional questions for Shannon and his staff? Okay, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone participating in the call. Um, this, it looks like at the peak we had about 113 people on the call. So um, Kimberly and Shannon and your staff know that um, your message was, was heard and you may be receiving some follow-up comments from folks with questions. Um, but in the meantime, don't forget that via the website you can grab the um, documents that were discussed on today's call. And you can also um, reach, out, reach out to anyone here at City Match if you have additional questions. And, and in closing, um, I want to tell you to keep your eye out for additional, um, the two upcoming additional action group calls. The second one will be June 6th, same time, 2 p.m. Central. And that will be hosted by the Science Action Group. And then our third call will be August 17th, 2 p.m. Central Time. That will be hosted by the Member Action Group. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you on our next call. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. The conference has been muted.